it's welcome to the resolution. Hey, this is Jay Freeborn in Washington Tax. So welcome to The Resolution, our podcast on topics pertaining to IRS collections, IRS tax compliance, expats, the whole nine yards. Today's episode is about when the IRS files for you uh, when you don't file and how that works. It's also called an SFR, which is short for Substitute for Returns. So I'm here with Stuart Bloomfield, uh, another tax consultant on staff, and we're going to hash out uh, some of the themes of the when the IRS files for you. And at the end of the podcast, we're just going to do a quick recap on the requirements of LLCs and corporations to uh, report themselves to the Financial uh, Crimes Unit of the IRS, or otherwise known as FinCEN. But anyway, uh, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jay. Where should we start? Um, so... Our bread and butter, or 55% of our business, are our folks that come to us haven't filed taxes in a long time and are motivated to take action. And uh, one of the motivators is when the IRS literally files a return for you. I guess uh, one of the things that I have been observing is what characteristics, what are the characteristics of cases where the IRS files for you? And... Um, one of the top things is when you get a 1099K from a credit card company uh, for uh, payments you've received. I, I guess we should also add 1099 miscellaneous or NEC, which is called these days the 1099 NEC from your vendors that are kind of substantial. And so the substitute for return group of the IRS has been around for many years. They're cyclical in how they work. We're here in 2024 seeing it happen. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about the process of how they do it. You yeah. know, so they find people with those kind of uh, forms and um, they What's send... What's been reported to them, obviously. Yes. Sure. They send you a warning letter. Hey, please file. If you don't file, we'll file for you. Then they send a proposed letter saying, hey, we're going to file this for you which is called Form 4549, it's the same letter that auditor IRS auditors send to their peeps, uh, mm -hmm. send to you the auditee uh, before they assess. And they give you 30 days from that to respond. And if you don't respond, they send the notice of deficiency, which we have a whole podcast on. Uh, the notice of deficiency is your last opportunity to dispute the issue in tax court which you have 90 days from that letter. So that's the cycle of a substitute for return. They say, hey, hey, file your return. Okay, you're not responding. Here's what we propose. Then they'll basically take that 1099 for you and allow no deductions, right? And then you ignore that letter. You'll get the notice deficiency. Once the notice deficiency is ignored, the debt, you will have a debt with the IRS. They bill you. Yes, <laughs> Exactly. You are officially assessed. And we call they are called substitute for returns or SFRs. And I guess they're a part of the IRS compliance system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what do we do with a client who comes to us? What are the kind of options? Mm -hmm. An assessed debt is like a regular debt. If you are a financial hardship case, you can just not try to fix it. And maybe do an offer and compromise, or which show, showing your inability to pay the IRS, or maybe get the case closed for hardship by providing financials showing your inability to make payments. So that's the collection way of resolving it. If you have money, assets, etc., uh, and won't win an offer and compromise, then you need to fix the tax return. And contrary to what you would think, and this is true. This is pertaining to the notice of deficiency. If you are audited and lose in our assessed tax, the notice of deficiency is going to be sent to you with a tax court deadline. If you miss the tax court deadline, you owe the money. Now, with a regular audit, you can do an audit reconsideration as an alternative to tax court. There's 
not really any statute limitation on that except don't do it unless you really have the goods sure. and the evidence. But that, that that's on the audit piece. The beauty of SFRs, however, is the tax court case is, I guess, meaningful. Tax court deadline is meaningful to some legal nuanced way, but not for doing what you need to do, which is if you prepare that return with your tax preparer, that being us, the accountants at Washington Tax, and label the return as an SFR reconsideration, even if you miss the tax court deadline, you can submit it through a channel that we have to get it fixed. This is just based on our sample size of SFR cases. It remains to be seen whether every case will be fixed like this, but I think it's safe to say if you received a SFR notice that the IRS prepared a return for you in the next couple of years, you could probably fix it through the method that I've illustrated. The SFRs are a real foolproof system for the IRS to maintain the tax system by punishing people who don't file. Do you um, think we're seeing more of them these days then? Good I question. Know. I would say we're see- receiving more, but they're happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that 2007 to 13 was like the heyday <laughs> uh, uh, of SFRs. The, that, that organization was very busy. And it still, it still exists, still busy, but not not in the volumes that happened before. But nonetheless, if you don't have much income, not any 1099s, and you're staying underground and not coming out and joining the tax compliance system that the United States uh, government is built on, um, you probably won't get SFR'd. But there's more 1099Ks out there, more 1099 miscellaneous, and more commonly 1099NEC now. So there is a, if you receive that kind of income, you're going to get 1099. Just the way in which the work world works these days, more people are getting that kind of employment. Yeah. And the IRS them. has uh, worked to get the U.S. Department of Treasury to work with those vendors like credit card companies, Stripe, mm-hmm. PayPal. Mm-hmm. There was an annoying rule that they were looking to do Venmo, which is how people family members and friends exchange money it's kind of small ball Uh and that that there's no uh, i'm not here to speak on that topic i'm speaking about 1099s that are pretty big yeah you know um those get on the radar and they could potentially become sfrs Mm -hmm. now everything i've spoken about so far is on the individual side not on the corporate or partnership side corporates asians and Partnerships also receive 1099Ks from their credit card companies. I haven't seen a corporation or a partnership have an SFR done on it. I think the corporation partnership uh, compliance rate is higher than individuals, but I, we certainly here at Washington Tax see a lot of corporations, S corporations, and partnerships that are out of compliance, which does have me segue to another topic. Yeah, the new rules that were that just came into place yes. as of twenty twenty four, right? The beneficial ownership information disclosure. Reporting? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you you could probably find it through a Google. Uh, Washington Tax is doing this selectively for some clients, but if you have an LLC that's active, if you have a corporation that's active that was created before twenty twenty four, you have until the end of the year to basically disclose yourselves as the owners. Uh, this law was created uh, to avoid combat money laundering. But you have to wonder on the substitute for return theme whether that someday, and I don't know, I'm just fishing, but whether LLCs and corporations might face more scrutiny for their lack of tax compliance. But that's just speculation on my end. <laughs> don't don't uh, cash that check. But anyway, on that topic... If you do create your company or Washington tax entity team creates your LLC this year, which is what we do mostly, and then help you file your S-Corp election, you will need to relatively soon do the BOI reporting. You only have to do it once for the entire company's existence. If you have previously 
have an LLC or a corporation should definitely Google the BOI reporting. You'll get the link, get your driver's license or passports ready. It's a one-time thing. But if you do create a new entity this year uh, or Washington Tax creates it for you, you'll have to do it relatively soon, like 30 to 90 days. Uh, I'm not, don't quote me on the exact time period, but it's in that range. I don't think 30, more like 60 to 90. Nonetheless, uh, Washington Tax Services is celebrating its 35th year in continuous operation. WATax.com contains all of our podcast episodes and uh, an active blog of meaningful information for multiple year non-filers, IRS collections, problems, and expats, uh, and entities in business tax help. Uh, I'm Jay Freeborn, one of the licensed tax professionals that does answer the phone, and you are? That's right. 888-282-4697 is the phone number. Or go to watax.com and shoot us an email with an explanation of your tax issue. Uh, Nice talking to you, Stuart. Good to talk, Jay. Have a good one. Thank you.